Don't ask me why I chose to speak about membranes, because I don't remember. Uh, and maybe because I, I haven't been working on them for quite some time. Uh, and so first, uh, actually, I, I was uh, turned on by Jean-Francois. And I will give you examples of uh, uh, you know, what does the variation of fluctuation dissipation bring to this kind of system. And uh, to start with, I will, st I will start with the simplest example, which actually Jean-Francois introduced, that of a colloidal particle in a laser trap. And just illustrate uh, uh, this kind of scaling analysis that I want to propose. And then I will uh, apply the scaling analysis to membranes in and out of equilibrium. And in particular, I try to show that uh, uh, how fluctuations are connected to dissipation. And, and, uh, uh, and uh, show that in some cases, if you change dissipation, and if you're out of equilibrium, you should see it in some kind of spectacular way. And then I will switch to a completely different topic, which is though somewhat related, but I, I, will, not, I will not speak about fluctuation, but just ab about general uh, uh, dy dynamical evolution. And this is something called de novo lumen formation. And I'll show you why it may be interesting. And uh, at the end of it, if I am not too slow, I don't know, maybe I'll be, I'll be slow. I'll say a few words about cell, cell adhesion. I was hoping to be able to tell more. But it turns out uh, we are trying to do it clean, and we are not able to do it clean up to now. So <laughs> uh, we'll probably see almost nothing on that. Uh, first. Oops. Let's start on this very simple ex example of a you know, colloidal particle, a bead, in a laser trap. And let's you know, move it in and out in just one dimension. And Jean-Francois introduced the, the dynamical equation, which is a Langevin equation with the uh, uh, friction term. I, you know, I omit the mass term here and, and some uh, uh, elastic you know, restoring force here and just the, the noise. And by the way, I encourage you to read Langevin paper, original paper, 1908. And I love the introduction. Uh, in the introduction, he speaks a bit of Einstein results, so Einstein formula. And then he goes, von Schmulukowski got a pretty similar relation, but he has a factor of four third to the power three which Einstein does not have. But if you do the angular integral correctly, you find one. So and it's very I mean, reassuring that a guy like von Schmulikowski is able to make mistakes in an inter, you know, angular integral. So don't worry if it happens to you. You know, all of people have done that before. Uh, and, 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 and all these guys completely ignore the paper by Thuderland, which was before Einstein, a few months before Einstein. So, and, and all these, these beautiful little stories are, are, are well uh, explained in the Bertrand Duplantier uh, uh, a paper on Brownian motions. Beautiful paper as well. So I encourage you to read these papers. Uh, anyway, so uh, uh, you know that Jean-Francois told us that the average of the noise should be zero, and the noise correlator uh, if, the, if you choose your dynamics slow enough, can be considered as delta correlated. So in only when the time difference is extremely slow small compared to the, the response time of that system, which is friction over elastic modulus, that uh, uh, you can consider that to be a delta function. It should be proportional to friction and to temperature. And uh, it's easy to do calculation. You find uh, uh, your correlation function which decays expansion exponentially with time. But the, the main result which we'll be using is that the equal time correlation is simply 
you know, in the thermodynamic quantity, any equal time correlation, by, as a matter of fact, would be a thermodynamic quantity and it's temperature over the elastic modulus. And, and, and nowhere you find friction coefficient in that relation. Okay, uh, now I'll propose a different way of thinking about that relation. And, and let's say, and, and it's a bit in, the spirit, in that spirit that Langevin actually discusses his, uh, his paper, although he doesn't use exactly the same uh, tricks. And uh, uh, so this uh, uh, bead you know, gets kicked, and gets kicked over time that we don't know. And let's call that an elementary time. And it has to be short compared to the response time of the, of the bead in the trap. Uh, OK, and now what I will claim is that the average of this, the square displacement is nothing but the elementary square multiplied by the number of kicks that the system has been experiencing during the response time of the system. So elementary uh, uh, response to the elementary time kick and the ratio of the response time of the system divided by the kick time of the system. Uh, what does that give? So if we take seriously the delta function, now we, we know that there will be a prefactor, which will be KBT times friction. Uh, now the delta uh, over the time tells me I should have a one over this elementary time, since after integration over the time, I should find one. So that gives me one over tau here. Now I get a tau square from this solution, a short time. I just have dx dt equals noise, right? Divided by friction here. So which means that x is linear in time somehow. And uh, uh, so this is this tau square here, friction square here, and everything uh, done. What do I find? I find KBT of oxide multiplied by this elementary time. I find Einstein formula, actually. So very simple reasoning, I get Einstein formula. Now I plug that relation into that relation, elementary time drops out, and I wind up with thermodynamics. So what I, what I see with this uh, simple example is that the equal time response of your system, <coughs> or mean square, is just you know, proportional to the number of kicks. Because you have, you know, you have plus minus kicks, and, so, and the average of the kicks is 0. And what is not 0 is like for diffusion square root of the kicks. And now you square it, it's just linear in, the, in this number. That's all I have done, nothing more. OK, but now suppose I turn uh, uh, on top of that laser trap. I turn a magnetic trap, and I, I you know, I, I, I control the current going in the coils with my with a computer, and with a computer I can do whatever noise I want, and this will be completely out of equilibrium because I decide what this noise is, and it will not satisfy fluctuation dissipation, and now if I uh, suppose I maintain the elementary kick constant, and I bring uh, some surface close to the bead so that the friction goes to infinity. And if I maintain this uh, elementary kick constant, the uh, fluctuation, uh, uh, mean square fluctuation will shoot to infinity. And of course, if I was to maintain the force, it would be the contrary. It would not, it, it would basically decrease. So I, the minute I am, out, you know, I, I turn on and out of equilibrium noise, I can do whatever I want. And so now I turn, let's turn to membranes. And uh, uh, now we start with the free energies. I guess Jean-François again introduced a free energy. And here on the right is Jean-François hero. On the left is my hero. <laughs> Choose. <laughs> Uh, uh, so, you know, Sophie Germain, and she worked out that piece. So the piece which corresponds to, uh, to flexion. And uh, actually, she was a fantastic scientist, and uh, she had a wonderful uh, correspondence with Gauss, for instance. 
And anyway, so if you, you all know, uh, you know to you how to use equipartition theorem, and now if you switch to real space back, you find that uh, the uh, uh, mean square displacement of now of the membrane, dis you know, the membrane displacement, will for uh, in the absence of tension, will grow like the square of the patch that you are considering, the length scale you are, co you are considering, and in fact that's and, and the, really the one who understood. Uh, how important that fact is uh, was Elfric, and he calculated repulsion forces, entropic forces. Actually, I was in a, at, the, at the Golden Conference where he first pr proposed that this uh, um, uh, entropic interaction was what was maintaining highly swollen namela phases. It was very interesting because no, nobody believed him at that time. And it's only after seeing experiments by Sir Safinia and Didier Roux that people believe that. I mean, it's, uh, uh, so whenever you get something you really believe in, and if your friends don't believe you, don't be afraid. It's a good sign. Uh, OK. Uh, and so now let's, let's try to do the same thing, but dynamically. And so uh, what we did back uh, years back uh, so introduce a permeation equation. So here would be the uh, rate of displacement of the membrane. Uh, here is the flow. And so if these two guys are not equal, that means there is a flow through the membrane. And, uh, and this is proportional. In the, this uh, coefficient of proportionality is called a permeation coefficient. And uh, uh, you know, the pressure to pressure difference and yeah, I'm just uh, adding two noise, one thermal noise and one uh, uh, non-equilibrium noise that I wish I will discuss later on. And then you have Stokes law in the, in the bulk of the fluid and on which you have to uh, uh, take care of Laplace pressure. And this, is, this term is just Laplace pressure. And you have the uh, uh, fluctuating hydrodynamic force. So the, uh, the, the thermal fluctuating force uh, 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 due to permeation uh, obeys something very similar to what we've done with the colloid. And now it's 1 over lambda p rather than uh, uh, the friction set, the psi that we had before. It's just because lambda p is on the right side of the equation. Uh, and you have a delta function, so the noise is correlated over very small patches uh, on the membrane. This guy for hydrodynamics, you all know that. You all re re uh, read, for instance, uh, Landau's book on hydrodynamics. But uh, and you can understand, uh, uh, actually, again, with the uh, uh, correspondence with the, the bead, uh, the friction now is eta Laplacian. So eta grad square is friction. And for the rest, it's just the same thing. But now it's a delta function. It's, it's, it's uh, local in the three-dimensional world now in, in the fluid. OK, and uh, so let's, let's try to see whether or not our argument uh, concerning uh, the uh, integration time uh, works for that case. And let's, let's look at the permission regime. So I should tell you the permission regime with this conventional membrane does not exist. And uh, uh, in fact, when, uh, another story I should tell you when we first wrote the uh, uh, equation on, on, on this type of problem with, with Robin Brinsma, uh, we had the idea that you know, if you compare, so the product viscosity times permission is like 1 over Q, so it's a length scale. And a la Pierre Gilles de Gênes, we said the, this length scale has to be the, the membrane thickness. This is the only thickness you have in that problem. And this, this is utterly wrong, because then we went into the literature, we looked at the uh, uh, measured value of this guy, and that we know is that the viscosity of water. Uh, uh, but if you just look at it, this length scale is not the membrane thickness. It's more like a 10 Fermi's, extremely small. And so what do we miss in this argument? The prefactor, indeed, is a membrane thickness, but you have the exponential of a potential barrier, e to the minus w over kt. And this is basically 10 to the minus 5. 
So, so if we do that, we miss a factor of 10 to, 10 to the minus 5. One has to be careful with this kind of uh, argument that we use very often, but sometimes it's completely wrong. OK, so now back to uh, uh, the mean square uh, uh, displacement of the membrane. So again, you have the response to an elementary kick. We have the, the integration of all the, the kicks that you get during uh, 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 a response time of the, uh, now of the membrane. But now you also have, the, you have to count uh, the number of independent patches, which give you independent kicks. So you have to multiply by that guy. But you also want to take the average over that, the patch. And the average over the patch for, for the displacement field is the number of independent patches. The, so for the square is the, num the number squared. And now, so the scaling is the integration, you know, the number of kicks during the integration time divided by the number of independent patches. If I do that, and, and uh, uh, we just repeat the kind of argument that we've done before, and sure enough, you find that at, at the end of the day, you find it's kt over the uh, elastic modulus time L square. Back to L freak. Okay? And so this kind of scaling works. Now, how about in the hydrodynamic regime? Now, dissipation is in the bulk. And so this, and this is most of the, uh, so the regime where for, uh, uh, membranes uh, uh, work is, in fact, that regime most of the time. I'll show you examples where it's not true. But uh, uh, most of the time, uh, membranes uh, sit in that regime. And now, so dissipation is in the bulk. So the kicks, the elementary kicks, are in the bulk as well. So how do, and, and, and then it's easy to find out you know, how much kick I get in that, in that bulk guy. But you have to understand, how is it transmitted to the membrane? And now we have, so locally, we generate, or the fluctuations generate a dipolar field. And so the, di the as you know, the dipolar velocity field falls off like 1 over r squared. And so, and, but then it will be entirely coherent over that length scale if, if the uh, 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 elementary volume is at a distance comparable to that distance here. And, and so, and, and now, so you have to propagate, so the elementary displacement here that you can with usual, and the other thing we have to be careful with is now you integrate over a, a volume, an elementary volume. The rest is basically the same. And uh, so you, you find the local square displacement. You transport it to the membrane. Gives you this B over L to the power of 4. And uh, now from the displacement, for, and that's for velocity. Uh, and if I want displacement, I have to multiply by the square of the correlation time. And now I wind up, again, if I do the algebra, again, kt as well over k. So even though dissipation is very far from the membrane, the result, as it should, obeys thermodynamics. And that's, uh, uh, that's something, I mean, thermodynamics is something, I mean, really, and, and the use of fluctuation dissipation is something very tricky. And sometimes it's more difficult to check that your equations work in the thermodynamic limit than writing dynamical equation. So write dynamical equation without paying attention, it's fine, easy to do. Checking that you have the right limit in the thermodynamic limit is much more difficult uh, usually. OK, so now let's turn, uh, let's, let's, let's look at uh, uh, assume that we have uh, on that membrane uh, pumps which can transfer volume from one side to the other. And we could look at uh, uh, short noise or coherent noise, so concentration fluctuations. Let's look at, at concentration fluctuations which give larger effect. So now we, we have uh, 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 two time scales. We have the response of the membrane, and you have the uh, concentration fluctuation. Uh, time scale, and that uh, will be, and we consider a membrane without tension. And so, 
since we are, we are considering fluctuation at the scale, we consider it at the scale, scale L of the membrane, uh, uh, now we have just one patch, one elementary patch. So we don't have to count how many independent patch we have, and just the result is just that of the colloidal particle. You just, we just have to count the, the number of independent kick and evaluate the elementary response. And that's done easily. And you find that the mean square displacement goes like uh, uh, L cube, because the time response of the membrane is no longer L to the, eta, L to the fourth over K, because dissipation is in the bulk. You pick up you know, 1 over L, uh, corresponding to bulk dissipation. And so this now is very different from uh, uh, what we had uh, uh, in thermal equilibrium, and that's the, the, that early paper uh, with Robin Greensmab. And it turns out that uh, we had calculated also uh, what happened if, you're, if, if the source was a curvature source, and this gives subdominant terms, and, and Robin didn't want to publish subdominant terms. So I couldn't convince him that we include that in our paper. I guess now with supplementary material, maybe we could put it in supplementary material, but he, he, he refused. And, and it turns out the Niagov worked work out the case when you have a, you know, a, a curvature source a few years later. Well, it's good for near, but we had done it. But that's, that's all right. Uh, I consider that the most careful work, uh, and, and, and Jean-Francois uh, uh, talked about it uh, was two weeks ago, uh, was done by Hervé Thurier, uh, considering uh, uh, fluctuation due to adhesion and de-adhesion of the uh, membrane on the spectrum uh, network. And I encourage you also to read the Hervé paper. Uh, all right, and then uh, let's look at uh, what happened if we bring the, uh, the membrane close to a wall. And, and, uh, uh, and I, here I will keep the tension because it makes my life easier. And uh, so if, if we are dealing with thermal noise, and uh, if the tension is large enough, the wall will basically do nothing. Uh, simply because there, will, there is a finite width here. There is a log term, but, but uh, uh, it means that uh, the, you know, the region where the membrane will fill the wall could be exponentially large. So I, I discard that. And now I replace the uh, thermal noise by an active noise. And, 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 I, and I, I, so I look at the dynamical equations. And now this volume here, which is squeezed between the membrane and the substrate, uh, is uh, either conserved, and this is that piece that Jean-Francois has been describing uh, quite a few times already, so this is a conserved piece. And there is a source term, you know, the fluid which can flow through the membrane. I'll come, I'll come back to that also later on. But what you saw, you see, and, and the flux, I mean, how fluid can go from there to there is with pressure, you need pressure gradients. And in a linearized version, uh, this flow will be proportional to grad P, but it comes, uh, uh, and that will be the flux. Here comes the divergence of the flux, and so, and the pressure is given by Laplace pressure. And you see that divergence of a grad is Laplacian. Now you get gamma Laplacian of Laplacian, Laplacian square, and, and, the, and the curvature will be Laplacian cube. So you see, it gets extremely slow. So there is a length scale at which, actually, this becomes so slow that everything will pass through the membrane. But let's look at, uh, for, for a second at a regime where uh, uh, it's not, you know, we are not to that regime here, but it's, it still goes, uh, uh, it's still driven by your pressure. And now if I do my, my scaling, I won't do it here because it would, it would be a bit long, but, but I, I find there, there is something which is exactly the same prefactor as before, and, but now the, uh, uh, the length scale dependence is at the power six. So it's a huge effect. So these experiments are not easy to do, and they have not been done. 
Uh, I'll come back in a second on that. Uh, then I was discussing with my friend Sri Ram Ramaswamy and John Toner. And Sri Ram said, well, you know, you've been very lazy because you've been uh, just discussing uh, uh, you know, the effect of pump fluctuation, but you didn't keep track of the fact that membrane curvature may react itself on the pump distribution. And so you didn't, you didn't keep track of all the possible symmetry coupling in the system. And so uh, I said, OK, fine, sure, why don't we do it? And so we, we wrote down the generic equation. And now as compared to what we did before, there are two new terms. So this term here, which tells me that if the membrane is bent, this induces a flow through the membrane. And this guy, uh, which tell me but that's what you would have in uh, thermal equilibrium, is that uh, Laplacian of uh, uh, distribution of this guy uh, will change the pressure difference across that. Now, similarly, for the dynamical equation, now you have to keep track of the dynamical equation of, the, of these guys, of so the pumps, let's say, explicitly. And uh, so there is, this is usual diffusion that we dealt with up to now. And there's this new term uh, corresponding to membrane curvature and, uh, and noise as, as before. And now before getting to uh, a noise analysis, uh, this, uh, this guy may have two interesting instabilities. One is a sort of a trivial instability that you would have with, with thermodynamics. And we just tell you that if you have a fluctuation, uh, a curvature fluctuation, uh, uh, this will bring in uh, more pumps in the, re in the curved region. And, uh, uh, and uh, this, may, this will give rise to an effective bending modulus. We may change sign, and you may get an instability. This other one is more interesting, and it has, to something, it has something to do with uh, this guy here. And it tells that if you have a fluctuation by which the membrane bends a little bit, then you increase the flow through the membrane. It will drag more, and it may rise, give rise to another instability. And this is a completely out of equilibrium instability. Now, suppose we are in a stable regime. And uh, let's do uh, the, uh, uh, the, the similar analysis as, as I've done before. Except now we have two variables. And, and the, the simple counting I introduced works with one variable. And, and you're, you're, it's, it's a bit difficult with two variables, except then the, the, what you can do is you diagonalize your problem. You find the uh, eigenfunction, the eigenvalues, and you can use the scaling for each of the eigenvalues. Uh, if you do that, and then you come back to your initial problem. If you do that, uh, you find that there is a piece which is what basically you would have with thermal fluctuations, but with an added, you know, this added uh, pump guy uh, which related curvature and pumping. And, and it's, it, uh, it comes in very similarly to membrane tension. That is membrane tension. And so you, have, so you have a renormalization, so to speak, of membrane tension. And then this piece is the leading piece. And uh, uh, it just comes from the fact that one of the eigenvalues for the, for, for the time response is just the diffusion time, essentially. And so uh, the, this is the only time which is left. And instead of finding uh, eta L cube over k here, you find L square over d. And that, for the rest, it would be the same. And, and so that looks pretty much, I could replace that by an effective temperature divided by an elastic modulus. And we believe that uh, what we have been measuring with Jean-Baptiste Manville and Patricia and Daniel Levy or Philippe Girard uh, and Patricia uh, a few years b b uh, before and after, uh, uh, is probably relevant to that analysis. And it was found here twice room temperature, you have three times room temperature. 
And so, uh, OK. Now, what you also find, and I don't, I don't want to show the, the corresponding math, but you find that this is some kind of wave, can generate waves. Of concert, and, and I don't do it because Jean-Francois has done it. You know, active system, bingo. If I have two uh, couple variables, it's very likely that it'll get waves. And uh, I should, and so in our early paper, probably the, the driving term was extremely small and probably not relevant to, to experimental physics. But it turns out that Ananio Metra, in his PhD work with Madan and Sriram, uh, has shown that if you consider a membrane with the cortex attached to the membrane, you can, in, 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 the, the, in good uh, limits, you, you can generate exactly those equations. And so, uh, even though when we, you just, you know, we're just giving examples, uh, it turns out uh, it does correspond in, in, in relevant uh, limits to uh, uh, waves that you could see in the uh, actomyosin system uh, connected to the membrane. And uh, so the bet of, uh, of Sriram, no, well, Sriram and Ananyu is that, you, so this is a keratocyte fragment, starts to move, and you see this, this wave, this ruffles moving down, so they claim that uh, it's captured by the few equations I've been showing you. Uh, actually, I've been a, a bit sloppy. I omitted the nonlinear term, but um, uh, OK, you can find it in that paper. Uh, in the, in an interesting point is that there, there is actually a, a nice paper by uh, Gautam Menon. And basically, his conclusion is that whatever we predicted uh, concerning the increase in the fluctuations uh, uh, coming close to a wall uh, is wrong. He doesn't say it's kind. He doesn't say it exactly that way, but uh, that, that's a conclusion. And uh, uh, because he doesn't find it. The reason why he doesn't find it is that he kills. So basically, it turns this factor F sub A here to zero. So there's no, there is no surprise if he doesn't find it. Uh, he, he, just, uh, uh, he just accepts that uh, this, this uh, activity will drive a force dipole in Stokes' equation. But that's completely different than a, a, a source term in the uh, permeation equation. It's completely different. And uh, uh, now if you think of wall effect with the Sriram equations, uh, you wind up with something which is ex basically this equation here, so as if there was no in free space, uh, with one big difference. And the big difference is that the tension term disappears. And it disappears because you pick up you know, two, deriv two more derivatives in the equation. So it becomes slow. And so only this guy uh, uh, stays. But this guy could be negative, And the sum of the two could be positive. So your system could be stable in the absence of a wall. And you bring it close to a wall, and it becomes unstable. You don't do anything more, but it could, it could become unstable. So there are the, still, there can be very spectacular effect bringing, you know, changing friction. All right. Uh, OK, so how, how much time do I have? Oh, 20 minutes, something like that, a bit more. OK, that's fine, that's fine. So and then I basically forgot about membranes. Uh, well, we work on nanotube with uh, Patricia, with uh, active gels, hearing, whatever, but, uh, uh, and, uh, but not, on, not on this kind of membranes. And Virgil Vyasnov in Singapore convinced me that uh, it was maybe uh, uh, the worst interesting problem there. And, uh, uh, and it's... Uh, uh, so-called lumen formation will give you examples. And, and uh, so there are a lot of uh, uh, cases where this is relevant. And, uh, and basically, uh, now, so in all what I've been using before, I ignored 
the, uh, uh, the possibility to shoot ions through the membrane, and this will become uh, the, the main uh, uh, force, actually, uh, uh, driving the system. And, uh, uh, and, and it turns out this is a generic way of faking channels in uh, developmental biology. And so, uh, uh, and, and Virgil is working on uh, how you make a bile canaliculi. And what I will show you is really scratching the surface and really uh, doing the simplest thing we can do. And uh, uh, let me just show you one, ex one nice example, and then I come to Virgil example. Uh, this is, so Siona is this kind of beast. So it's an acidian. Don't ask me what an acidian is. I already forgot. Uh, so it, uh, you, know, you can find that in uh, all the oceans around the world. And uh, in the early stage of development, you start you know, with a linear array of cells. And uh, these cells shoot ions in the domain uh, between the cells there. You see uh, you know, big blisters showing up. And eventually, they connect and get a tube. And what I will describe in the remaining minutes is just this tiny portion going from there to there. And maybe there, but not more. Uh, and uh, uh, Virgil does beautiful experiments. So now he takes two hepatocytes, put them in a trough, and looks at, uh, at those guys and, and uh, see what happens uh, as you, you know, as a function of time. And after a few minutes, you see this uh, uh, blister forming, and they call that a lumen. So here is one cell, it's the cell which is up. Here is a cell which is down. And here is a, uh, a space between the cells. Here the cells are almost touching. I'll come back to that. And, and here this guy grows. And it grows all the way to such a size. I mean, it depends on what you do. In that case, it became really big because he, uh, he's been, uh, Virgil has been uh, adding uh, uh, some myosin inhibitor. I'll come back on that. Uh, uh, but so you can follow the dynamics, the growth dynamics. And the question is, how do you describe that? And so first, uh, I'm fairly lazy, and so uh, I don't want to uh, keep track of the influence of nucleus or whatever. And so I will assume that the shape of these guys or a, a portion of spheres. Now, uh, the cell can shoot ions. In the case of a hepatocyte, the, uh, you have a bile salt transporter, so you shoot ions in this volume here. Uh, channels can transport back passively those ions. Uh, water can flow through aquaporins, so which are uh, uh, water channels. And here I should tell you that when I was speaking of uh, water pumps, I was cheating because it is no known water pump in biology. So it is, uh, it, it is uh, accepted by the community that uh, water is only transported passively. Maybe one day we'll find some pump, but uh, up to now, none have been, have been found. Uh, and, and there, the space between these two cells here I mean, it's about 40 nanometers. So 40 nanometers is not zero. You can't have a flow through this, this space, and you have to keep track of that flow, and it turned out it would be important. And uh, so now we have to keep track of ion conservation, volume conservation, or water of conservation. And of course, we have to balance forces. And if we do that, we'll have a set of equations that we can hope to solve and see what we expect. And so uh, another thing, another so force balance will involve a uh, uh, Young-Dupré uh, relation here, uh, which will define the angle of the spherical cap. 
with the uh, uh, interface, uh, uh, the cell cell interface. And uh, so if we, if we look at the space between the cells, now we are back to the equation I described of, of a membrane close to a wall, if you remember. There was a piece, the conserved piece there uh, with a flux piece and the source it is describing what goes through the membrane. Uh, so here we are dealing with, we're dealing with a dynamics which goes from minutes to hours. And so this is very slow compared to the time it takes for uh, you know, anything to equilibrate across this 40 nanometer here, be it uh, ion density or pressure or whatever. And so I can, you know, this guy would be set to zero very safely. Now, the flux, the uh, uh, ion flux, as a piece which, could, which can be transported or which is transported by the fluid flow here, parallel to the membrane. But again, we are dealing with extremely slow flows. So this guy is completely negligible compared to the uh, uh, diffusion term. And then we have to, to worry about the source. So the source has one passive piece, which you have a transport coefficient exactly of the kind that Jean-Francois is telling us about, and the connected force with the chemical potential difference of the ion uh, uh, in uh, the uh, paracellular domain and in the cell here, and uh, pumps. And this guy, and the out of equilibrium guy now is a pump. So this is that coefficient here. Uh, if I linearize the equation, I find that this guy is just the uh, uh, proportional to the osmotic pressure. And I can you know, cast this equation into a very simple equation. I wrote it in one dimension. In, in real life, you have to write it in two dimension, but just to show the existence of a screening length. And, and you, so you see that. Uh, uh, from, uh, uh, so again, you have the divergence of a gradient, so that gives you a second order, order derivative, which uh, implies the existence of that length scale. And that length scale, uh, you can put numbers on it. Uh, you know the diffusion constant, you know the thickness, density, you can, of course, temperature. These guys, this, uh, uh, you know, dissipative coefficient, you'd say it's not easy to find as such in the literature, but what, you, what you'll find is conductivity of membrane, and that's a huge literature for that. And you just have to transform uh, 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 that piece in elect you know, an electrochemical potential, and that will give you the value of this guy. So you also know that guy. And at the end of the day, you can show that this length scale is microns. And so, and typically, this whole thing would be 10 microns. This guy may be 2 microns or 3. I mean, we, we, you know, it's just order of magnitude wise. And so, we, within that region here, you can, be, you can feel the influence of the external ion density. But uh, uh, and in that region here, you can feel the uh, influence of the density, ion density in the lumen. And here, in between, it's entirely controlled by the pumps and the channels. And, so, and this is entirely controlled, basically, by, you know, by how many pumps and channels per unit area you have. Now, you can do the same thing in the lumen. So actually, same equation. Uh, with same parameters, so again you find this length. You have to keep track now of the flux which can come in or come out uh, from the sides, on both sides, but that's uh, fairly easy to do. Now you have to balance forces. And uh, balance forces first in the, in, the, in the paracellular domain here, and now you have uh, uh, you have cadherins, so you have uh, uh, adhesion uh, proteins here, and that, that you can uh, uh, describe by an elastic modulus, and that sets 
an optimum uh, thickness for this paracellular region here. And, and then this is a tangent term. Uh, you could worry about tangential forces, but you, here you just put uh, numbers in again. I mean, the flow that you have are so small that for all particular matter, the tension is constant along uh, uh, the, the spiral cellular domain. Here you must satisfy Laplace equation. So the pressure is controlled entirely by the size or by the radius of curvature of the lumen. And you cannot uh, uh, you know, cheat about that. But there is an important point, is that the tension now is a dynamical tension. Because if, uh, uh, if this guy changes size, there is a viscous term. And this, uh, the, this ratio here is a, uh, essentially uh, uh, the ratio of the uh, cortex viscosity by a contractility that Jean-François just introduced today. And so this is this guy here. And, uh, and then you have to satisfy force balance parallel here to the uh, interfacial uh, cell cell region. And this is just a young Dupri, but now it's a dynamical young Dupri because of that relation here. OK? Now you have to conserve volume. Again, same type of equation. Uh, the source term is simpler because it's completely passive and it involves the chemical potential difference of water through the membrane. And this, is, uh, this chemical potential difference is the difference between the uh, uh, pressure and the osmotic pressure. And uh, 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 what I just want to do, OK, and the flux now, uh, the flux is, is as before. Uh, in the wall example of a membrane uh, driven by a pressure gradient here. And so at the end of the day, what you find is, again, the same structure, an equation with a screening length here, and uh, uh, what drives the pressure to uh, a non-zero value is the osmotic pressure as a source term. But, but so, so if you sit, I mean, or if, if we look at a distance large compare to the screening length, the pressure here will be uh, given by the osmotic pressure. But if you sit close here, it will be much closer to the external pressure. If you sit here, it will be close to the lumen pressure. And uh, so now yeah, we can also work out the volume conservation uh, uh, in the lumen. And we say, Basically, similar equations with the same screening lengths, and, uh, and it controls the flux there that we get uh, from solving the uh, equation that we just introduced. We know the pressure at any given time. And uh, then you can look at the solutions. And first, you can look at steady state. And uh, typically, what you find if you, so as a function of the pumping activity here, and here I plotted the, uh, the, the radius, the observable radius, so the projected radius uh, uh, of, the, uh, uh, of, the, of the lumen divided by the contact length, uh, uh, the cell-cell contact length. So maximum can be just one. And you see that uh, you have two branches. So one unstable branch for small radia, and one stable branch, the red one, for large radia. And, uh, and this guy is unstable. Basically, is the same physics of a growing droplet. Uh, and we'll, I'll come back to why this guy is stable. And you see the, uh, uh, here is just showing that uh, you know, the, the shorter the screening length, the more you get to this side of uh, the, the cells. Now, here, you compare the uh, uh, density, ion density in the lumen to the ion density that you can have without leak, if there was no leak. And you see that when you start uh, growing your lumen, you're very close to one. 
except here there's a large uh, uh, screening length, so discard that one, but just look there. And as you get in the stable regime, the ion density drops very significantly. And you could say this is a complete waste because actually I want to uh, uh, evacuate as much bile as I can. But uh, uh, if, you, if there was no leak, necessarily the pressure, the osmotic pressure would be equal to the hydrostatic pressure. But the hydrostatic pressure cannot be big because it's bound by Laplace law. And, and uh, so it would be very small. And so you would just break everything or store nothing. And so the leaks are very important because that allows in what you see here. This is the, say, the osmotic pressure compared to the Laplace pressure. And you see that you start with, when they, it's very small, they, they are very comparable. But when you get in the stable, in the steady state regime, the osmotic pressure becomes much, much larger and, and can even be, here it's 20, but it can be even larger than that. And that's what allows you to evacuate your bile. So in fact, the leaks are very important. Uh, now, why is it that one can have a steady state? So the, uh, the unstable states in the growth uh, uh, is just like, uh, you know, growing, uh, a, uh, I don't know, a vapor. Uh, uh, droplet into uh, you know supersaturated uh, fluid, uh, but it turns out this would require really big uh, 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 osmotic pressures, and in fact this is probably not possible. I mean, uh, the, uh, what happens in real life, you probably get signaling or the instability I was mentioning uh, before is at the play, and I will come back on that. So preparing that talk, I realized that this sensitivity that we discussed years back maybe is at play here. Uh, now, why, do, why can we get stable steady state? And it has, it has to do with the lateral leaks. It's easy to understand that when the distance uh, of the side of the lumen to the size of the cell becomes smaller than the uh, screening length, now the leak diverges like one over that distance. And it, both the uh, uh, ion leak and the water leak. And so if you, if you get too close, you get uh, divergence and that stabilizes the system. Or depending on the, how, how the tension varies with time, you could also get oscillations. And uh, uh, that's what I show here. Uh, these are three different cases, just changing. So here we just changed the, uh, uh, the pumping activity, in fact, and not very much. And you get from uh, going you know, uh, you know, monotonically to a steady state. You can go with the uh, damped oscillations, or you, can go with, or you can get completely sustained oscillations. And in fact, uh, you can, uh, in, in the limit where the, where, the, where the lumen sit close to the edge of the cells and I mean, closer than the, uh, uh, the screening length, you can solve the problem analytically. And you can show that you cannot get oscillation if the tension is independent of time. To get oscillation, you do need uh, uh, the, that tension to be a function of time. And so what we did is uh, just inhibit the myosin activity. Just, you know, just turn on blebistatin and see what, what happens. And so let me just skip that. It's not so important. And so this is, the, let's say, wild type, and you get strong oscillations. And this is with blebistatin. So with blebistatin, basically, you, st you turn off <coughs> The, uh, the, the, uh, uh, the cortex uh, response, and you will lose completely your, uh, your oscillations. Uh, I get, so maybe uh, what I just want to say is that, so this idea that uh, leaks may be important and maybe 
a morphogenetic cue is, is, is uh, not so usual. And you see here, since you have leaks on the side, the lumen cannot you know, extend in this direction. And the only way it can extend is in that direction. And the, at the end of the day, that's actually how it connects. And I done nice uh, instability to work out uh, during that problem. Here, this is uh, uh, in the liver case. And now, so uh, the, the lumen develop in, this in the direction perpendicular to the board. And you have strong leaks there. So it cannot get there. So again, you sort of, if you, if you understand the role of leaks, you understand how it develops. Uh, I don't know. So I've been discussing what happens if the cell shoots ions in the paracellular domain. And that's when cells want to you know, detach from each other. Now, suppose they want to adhere. Why should they stop to zero? I mean, all the communi all the, uh, our community, uh, physicists and biologists alike, discuss only adhesion proteins. But, uh, uh, but I, I just, you know, pressure difference equal to zero just does not exist. It's a, uh, an ensemble of zero measure, so to speak. And either it's positive or it's negative. And my bet is that when you want cell to adhere, it develops a negative pressure in this paracellular domain. And, uh, and we have to understand, I mean, we, we have to develop the understanding of this situation. A nice observation is uh, made by Virgil Yasnov here, uh, which you start, you know, you put two cells again in contact, and you look at uh, either cadherins, which, which are the uh, uh, you know, adhesion proteins, and or actin. You, know, you could also look at something, I mean, it's looked also at myosin distribution. And at time t equals zero, uh, it's fairly homogeneous. I mean, you have fluctuation, but it's fairly homogeneous. And it turns out if you measure adhesion force at that time, and this was done by uh, uh, these people here, uh, actually uh, the Curie Institute and Ecole Normale, so Frédéric Pincet, uh, Jean-Paul Thierry, Sylvie Dufour, and, and so on. Uh, Eric Perez, I should not forget. What they find, they find that short time, it's about, you find 10 uh, nanonewtons, something like that, in the 10 nanonewton range of a rupture, as a rupture force. Now you wait. And, and they, when they, and they, they wait like half an hour, and they find that the rupture force goes to 800 nanonewton, much larger. And Virgil looked at what happened. And if you look at what happened, you see that, you know, you, you see large density fluctuations, and then both actin and cadherin leave the center they gather at the periphery, and you get a beautiful, and, and, and the cell spreads as well, and you get this beautiful ring of uh, both scattering and uh, actin, and, and on top of that is punctuated. I mean, it, it's a periodic structure. <coughs> and I would like to understand what is the role of pressure in that, in that problem. I cannot believe pressure doesn't play a role. But that's what, uh, the, this is a challenge I propose to Pierre Assens and uh, Amit Singh. Okay, thank you for your attention.